This one day I saw a video on YouTube of a woman that was my age hearing for the first time. And it really inspired me to think about like, like why isn't anybody doing this in the space? Like at the time there was like, you know, Tom's had just started and like Warby Parker and whatnot. So there was some people doing things with brands like philanthropically, um, but nobody was doing anything in hearing or in electronics. So that's kind of how the idea happened. But uh, I mean, I have zero experience in engineering or anything like that. I was always in the music side of things of like marketing and sales and, you know, like definitely nothing in the technical world. Right. Uh, as stated, I have Bridget here, Bridget Hilton from Listen. Welcome, Bridget, to the Not Almost There podcast. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. When I read about your company, I was super impressed with uh, with not only the fact that you created this um, this audio company, um, that in itself is just a crazy feat, but the philanthropy component uh, and what you do and how you've been able to give back. Um, so I want to kind of set up this by you telling the audience like what listen is um because obviously it's a consumer electronics business but there's there's so much more to it um so let's let's start there sure so listen is a an audio company we sell headphones speakers earbuds basically anything that a normal consumer would use to consume audio or podcasts etc um, and we sell all around the world, but mostly in the U.S. in places like, you know, Whole Foods and Amazon and Nordstrom and Barney's and places like that. But um, mostly we sell online. Uh, we do a lot of corporate partnerships. We work with people like Delta Airlines and Spotify and whatnot. Um, but the best part about the company is that we started it to give back. So we started it in 2012 um, with the idea of for every purchase somebody makes, like we contribute to giving hearing aids to people in need. Um, and since then, we've actually traveled around the world and given 50,000 plus people hearing for the first time. So it's been, needless to say, like the greatest experience of my life. Um, we've been able to travel to like, you know, 30 countries around the world and see people here for the first time, like over and over and over again. Uh, incredible experience. I love it. And, um, yeah, that's basic background on listening. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I mean, just to pause there and just give you a round of applause for thinking about giving back in the in the way you did and and why why headphones? Like you went into this. Obviously, it's a competitive space in 2012. You know, Beats were around, I believe. Um, Apple was designing their own headphones. I don't know if the the earpods were around then. Probably probably sometime later. But it it was it's a very crowded market. So like, why headphones? So it's funny, if we would have known how competitive it was, we would have never done yeah. this. <laughs> like, like if I would have went to CES, like in 2012, I would have been like, I'm never starting a headphone company. Like that's, that's the crazy. best though, right? I mean, it's the, it's the naivete <laughs> that gives us the strength because you don't know what's on the other side. Like I faced that, that a ton. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, being naive has definitely helped yeah. us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's really crazy. I can't believe we even pulled it off. But um, yeah, so we chose headphones because it is such a, a regular consumer product that pretty much everybody uses. And there were no brands in electronics at all that had a giving back component. So we wanted to be like the first brand in electronics to give back. And uh, we're, luckily, we pulled it off and we've like carved out this awesome niche for ourselves but yeah, like you said, it's, you know, competing against the biggest companies in the world is a huge, huge problem for us. And um, we've just been lucky to like still survive, honestly. So, so I want to unpack that a bit more because you're, there's parts of the story I must be missing. How do you go from like your music lover to like building, uh, building electronics that you actually can then turn around and sell and, and create a business from period? Because you need to be a at least somewhat of a profitable business to be able to give back, or at least you're giving your, your revenue back and that is factored into your P&L. But like, how do you even start that? Like, did you have a background in engineering or were you creating a first prototype? Like, how does that even happen? So the idea for the company came from, uh, 
I've done music like before listen, I was in the music industry for 10 years. And so I love music. It literally saved my life when I was a kid. Um, I've always loved it. And it was always like the thing that I wanted to do. Um, and then after, you know, spending 10 years in the industry, I, it was kind of burnt out and whatnot. And this one day I saw a video on YouTube of a woman that was my age hearing for the first time. And it really inspired me to think about like, like why isn't anybody doing this in the space? Like at the time there was like, you know, Tom's had just started and like Warby Parker and whatnot. So there was some people doing things with brands like philanthropically, um, but nobody was doing anything in hearing or in electronics. So that's kind of how the idea happened. But uh, I mean, I have zero experience in engineering or anything like that. I was always in the music side of things of like marketing and sales and, you know, like, Definitely nothing in the technical world. So it was a huge uh, learning experience. So so what would you, so people that have ide- ideas for things, like a limiting factor is a lack of experience, right? For whatever they want to get into. How, how did you, what were your first actions that you took to start to develop headphones? Did, did you find an engineer? Did you go to like a contracting service and and talk to them about your idea? Like what what happened? So it's funny, I met my business partner right after I had the idea and we um, basically just met, like had a handshake deal and jumped on a plane to China and (laughs) literally just found a manufacturer. (laughs) So uh, we had, you know, made some connections through like Alibaba and whatnot with different headphone manufacturers. I mean, basically when you go there, it's like they all make all of the products in like a few different factories. So there's not really like, you know, there's only like a few people that you need to like talk to to like know all of the different factories. Sure. So we wanted something that would look completely different than anything else that was out there, which, um, as you know, most headphones look exactly the same. They're just like plastic and, you know, not that exciting, but um, we wanted something that looked different. So we went into China knowing that we wanted like wood headphones to be like our first product because as cool as the cause was, it wasn't really something that people would talk about if they didn't, you know, get asked about. Like if you're wearing right. a pair of wood headphones, someone might come up to you and be like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and then you can tell them about the cause. But nobody's going to do that if it's just like a black plastic headphone. Right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The product has to be number one. Otherwise, the mission can fail easily. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. There's so many brands that have great missions, but the product doesn't, you know compete with the mission so they fail unfortunately but um so we wanted to avoid that fate so so. before we go too far ahead you said music saved your life when you were a kid how how did music save your life so i grew up in uh flint michigan and it was just kind of um you know i had a a very interesting background uh lots of trauma in my life and uh, lots of you know just issues around being young growing up and uh the way that I would kind of like numb out from all of that is just to like listen to music and like have this dream of like someday I'm going to get out of this place and like be successful and get out of this world, you know? And uh, I started really, really young. I started in the music industry when I was like 15 and uh, I never looked back from there. I was just like gone. So I started doing all like the little jobs, you know, that like the entertainment industry has, you know, like I hung up posters and I worked at a music venue and I wrote for the local paper about music and I worked in retail and just basically anything that I could do to like get to the next point where I could like hopefully meet someone that would like get me out of this space and like take me out of Flint, Michigan and go somewhere like where I could do something bigger with my life. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's incredible. And I, I too found music to be very helpful growing up. I had trauma as well. And I think it's because it just, it's puts you in a position where you're present and you're focusing on trying to listen to lyrics and words and the stories that the musicians are telling. And that's, that's what I found to be like the, the best part of it. Like it's one thing to listen to music and appreciate the beats and the rhythm and, you know, all the musical instruments. It's, it's another to like try and really unpack what, the songs about and then try to dive deep. And, and I totally can relate to that. Cause that, that was, that was me as well. Like growing up, just listening to records and vinyl in my room 
at the time, I think I had a water bed. I would just lay on this water bed and just like daydream and like listen to Bon Jovi and and uh, of crazy, you know, 80s uh, hair metal bands back in the day. And then, then my taste evolved very quickly to Led Zeppelin and Beatles and all that fun uh-huh. stuff as well. Yeah. yeah. I loved it. So, it so, all right, 2012 – you're you have experience in the music business you're you start to create this product how how do you go about getting the product to market i want to i want to find out a little bit more about that sure so we had to take a very non-traditional route Um, as you can imagine we didn't quite have the money that apple has (laughs) so we we were trying to like find our niche in all of these like little places that we could stand out where um, these like giant companies were not. And like, I guess I'd like to say like these bigger brands kind of actually helped us because they were borrowing our authenticity. Like we, for example, like we did a a commercial with Google, like this, the second year that we were in business and it ended up getting like 70 million views online. And it was about like using YouTube to advertise your small business but you know they're never going to do that for someone like an Apple or Beats or whatever. Like they were using our story to like be authentic in their marketing, um, which was super helpful for us. And that was awesome. Um, we also did a lot of like like we were the first electronics in Whole Foods, for example. Mm. Um, so we're trying to like find these niches of like where people are that are like our audience, but not necessarily like putting the dollars down for Target, for example. Um, we've done a lot of subscription boxes. So like one of our first big things was like when we did birch box and it was like, you know, 25,000 units or something like that, where you just don't really get that immediate feedback if you're in retail in like traditional retail. So we kind of, yeah, we were always looking for those, those like little opportunities to plug ourselves in. So how important is that? It seems like that's a theme in your life is being, trying to stand out from the the type of headphones from the fact that there's a philanthropical component to where um, you're where you're merchandising the, the headphones all these are, are unique things it's like the Peter Thiel zero to one book right like you'd rather be first in in something than second um, just how important is that in life and in in business overall that you found through either your own personal, experiences or through watching others that you've that you've seen over the years that's funny I've never really thought about it in that way but you're totally right um everything that I do is is in that vein like I I didn't grow up with money or anything like that but I've had the most incredible experiences in my life because I've kind of like found that way Mm. to like make it happen without being wealthy or without you know knowing the right people or whatever uh, and it really just comes down to like making the goal and like making yourself aware of like what you want and making a plan on how to get there as simple as that sounds, but just being in the right places and trying to, you know, put it out there in the world. Like this is what I want. And then hopefully eventually it comes back to you. Yeah. Have, have you seen your peers do similar things over the years? Yeah, for sure. Um, we have a lot of friends in the entrepreneur world, but, um, I don't know. I've also seen a lot of my friends like take the more traditional path. And like, you know, when I started in the music industry, I was so young. And now my peers from that are like the executives at the big companies, which is really great to see. So I've kind of seen both ways. And you said it was your first like big breakout through that that YouTube commercial or what, were there other things? How did you, I guess before you, you answer that, like how did you even get your first deal and how exciting was that was that at a merchant or was it the birch box like what was the the first like big thing right um you know i would actually say something that was really helpful for us like in the very very beginning is that uh tim ferris put us in his subscription box at the time and he like blasted it out online and like you know how crazy his fan base is um and so we got tons of immediate feedback and we were literally like packing all these orders, like, you know, in the living room, we didn't have an office or a warehouse or anything like that. So it was really a, a fun time. The beginning of a startup is always like the most fun. How did Tim Ferriss find out about it? Uh, we, we met him randomly at an event okay. and I think just, you know, 
sent him some headphones or something. Got it. Got it. <laughs> and you had no idea that was coming? Uh, we, we thought like maybe he'll talk about it or something. We never really thought that he was going to order a bunch of product because we didn't even know that he had like, I think it was called quarterly at the time. Yeah. Um, we didn't know that he had like that subscription service. So yeah. it was great. And yeah, we did that. We did the Google commercial. We did Birchbox. Um, we were in Nordstrom for a while and you know, all this, like, it kind of like snowballed from there and, um, then we got like the biggest deal eventually was with uh, Delta Airlines where we did all of their first class headphones. Very cool. So that was pretty amazing. Yeah. So what, what have you, uh, this is going to be a loaded question, but what are like some of the key things you've learned along this journey it's from 2012 till, till now? Uh, I think in general, like life experience is what counts. Yeah. So we could have gone a lot of different paths. We could have like, you know, worked every minute of every day and never had experiences and been super unhappy, but we've taken the path of like prioritizing experiences. So when we go travel or whatever, we'll always take like a few days and just do something fun in like the philanthropic part of it really has like changed my life. And that's, I guess that's something that I would apply to any business and that I would ever start is like having a cause behind it because it really like not only does it help other people, obviously, but it really helps you as a person grow. Yeah, you wait. I imagine you wake up in the morning and you you have this um, sense of uh, of meaning that you're doing this not only for yourself and your business and but it's you're changing, like literally changing the world. Like you're giving people the ability to hear that or hearing devices or make them hear better than they were otherwise because it's something you created from nothing. Yeah, it's crazy. Trust me. I mean, 50,000 people is it's a lot of people. And those are all like boots on the ground, like us traveling to physically do that. So, I mean, we traveled from... 2013 to 2019 pretty consistently to make that number happen um it was wild you know nine out of ten people can hear with just a hearing aid so that's incredible it's such a terrible thing in the world that this is such a huge problem when it's such an easy solution most of the time that's that's phenomenal so you you mentioned uh shared experiences i so believe that like it's hard to explain to people how important that is and can in comparison to tangible things. Uh, and you kind of have to go through a journey to realize it. And I, I definitely have, and I would give up most of what I have for more shared experiences. Like it's, it's just, you, they're stories that live on in your mind and they live on in through photos. And you just have such a deep, rich sense of, of being um, versus, you know, buying a, a thing. And uh, so I'm, I'm right there with you. One of those shared experiences I know is somehow you were face to face with a lion or at some <laughs> point in time. Uh, and I don't claim to know this story very well. So I'd love for you to explain it. Like, how did that happen? Uh, <laughs> uh, we've spent a lot of time in like East Africa. Um, been very, very lucky to spend a lot of time there. I love it there. But, uh, that story, that's really funny that you said that. Um, I think that was like in 2014, but uh, yeah, we were on a safari in Kenya and uh, we like had stopped and like there was some sort of like issue with the car or something. And there was a lion like right in front of us. And it was, you know, lionesses are the ones that hunt the, the male lions don't really hunt, which is interesting. Mm. But um, so there was like this giant lioness right in front of the car and there's no doors, nothing like the car is like stalled. It's not working. (laughs) This lion like looks directly into my soul, into my eyes and is like crouches down and like literally right as it's jumping like the car, we got the car working and like pulled away. But it was like it was so close. Did it it chase the car? (laughs) Yeah. No way. But. I mean, only for like a second, but yeah, it was pretty scary. And it's just, you know, we've had a lot of moments like that where it's like life or death kind of situations. And um, (laughs) that's something I think about all the time. It's like, is 
what do I want to do like before I eventually die? And like, what do I, what are my regrets going to be? And like, how do I not have those regrets? And so that was just like one of the more like funny, I guess, moments wow. <laughs> that we've had with life or death. So what, what, what did someone inspire you to think that way? Or is that from your upbringing and just being in Flint? Like how, how did you start to live intentionally like that? Um, I'm not sure how, I guess, not sure how it exactly started, but something that really, really, um, impacted me. It was actually last year was like the worst year of my whole entire life. Um, I was like diagnosed with clinical depression and then like I had a terrible separation. Um, I was living in San Francisco with my ex and his kids and we had a dog and a cat and I was flying back and forth from LA, San Francisco, like twice a week. And it was just a very crazy life, like a lot going on. And then after my separation, I moved back to um, LA and then right as that happened, COVID started. So it was like, <laughs> then it was just, it was like a domino. Like all these things were happening. I was so sad. I was all by myself. And then COVID happens. And then Listen loses like half of our revenue. And then we lose our employees that have been there since the very beginning. And it was just like snowball effect of all these like terrible things happening. And so that was a huge wake up call for me. Um, that was when I started living like way, way more intentionally because there was like, you know, like I counted like a hundred plus days where I cried in a row and I was just like super depressed. Um, so at that moment, I was like, there's like a path that you can take either. This is how your life is. And then, you know, your life might end or this is it can be better if you just like put in the work. And I like actively chose to put in the work and like since that moment, like I've just been super, super hyper focused on bettering myself, like as a person and like, you know, just getting super deep into like the super like self-help world and whatnot. Um, and I have like a few different things that I've really like leaned on there. Um, yeah, experiences are part of that, you know, it's like, mental health through experiences like you're happier when you have more experiences you're smarter when you have more experiences so living intentionally very important to me what was your journey in finding help during that period i can't imagine that um and it's it's interesting because i think la was affected in a major way. I mean, not that everywhere in the United States was, but LA was so locked down. My, my daughter, who is now 23, she lived there and she had a similar experience. Like she didn't meet anyone. She was just kind of stuck in her place. Like there's nowhere to go. And she's in, in a community where she just didn't really have friends. So it, it was really hard on her too. Um, but what did you what did you do then at that point? Like, like, or I guess walk me through the process of how you discovered and found help for yourself. Um, cause I know, I know, uh, and I want to get into things like the, your journaling and, uh, gratitude and the Hoffman Institute and all of that. But what's like the first thing you would do or recommend to someone to do to find an outlet for help? For me, yeah, it was really crazy because my whole identity was like tied into, you know, my relationship and my, my job and my, you know, living where I lived or whatever. And so it was definitely a moment where I had to like take a step back. So I think if you're giving advice to someone, like take a step back and then realize like what you want and like just being aware of what you want is like the first step right? Like I, all I wanted was to not feel that way. <laughs> I wanted to like live an authentic life. I wanted to like find happiness. Um, I wanted to obviously get my business back on track and whatnot and, you know, be around people that inspire me and have new experiences. So it's like you, you take the path like towards that. Um, so being aware is the first part. I think that obviously therapy is a huge, huge help. Um, that's, you know, goes without saying that you definitely need to like talk to somebody about the issues. You know, they say, if you don't go within, you go without. And I really believe that. Um, and for me, like I, I love reading. So ever since I was really young, I've like read a book per week. 
And that's something that's like been a great habit for me. But, you know, in this moment, like all of my book reading kind of went to like the self-help world. (laughs) So I basically have like a whole bookshelf of like self-help books. And that really, truly did help me. But it only helps if you actually, you know, do the work. You can't just read them. (laughs) What was your, what are some of the books that have stuck with you? You read them? Um, So honestly, a lot of like the classic just awareness books, like, um, like learning about attachment styles and relationships, learning about like love languages or, you know, Brene Brown and stuff like that, where it's like everyone that's in the self-help world has read those, but I had never like taken the time to do that myself. So it was a huge help for me just to be like aware of who I was and like kind of learn more about myself through these books um, I really liked the, like the Anagram stuff as well. Um, I don't know if you're into that no, at I all. I haven't heard it. You said Anagram? Uh, Anagram. Oh, Anagram. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain that? Sure. So it's, it's nine different types of a person basically. And like you go through and kind of like figure out which type you are. And then there's like a good part of it and a bad part of it and if you're aware of what type you are then you can like work through it and 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 understand why you do the things that you do what what type of person are you (laughs) uh i'm (laughs) i'm a three you're three (laughs) and then you can have like a wing so i'm like a four wing got it so it's a numeric system Uh uh-huh got it cool well we'll have to We'll have to dive deep into into what that what a three is, um, <laughs> but maybe we could say that for for another time because it sounds. It sounds <laughs> I would love I would love to talk more about it. It's really fun. Yeah, cool. So so then what? Once you started to learn kind of the type of person you were, or you are, what did you do that? And were you like when did you start to look into journaling and and uh, all these other things? Yeah. So once you're like aware of like what you want and like who you are kind of, I just, I really started, I started this program called made for that was really helpful. Um, It's basically like a habit forming program and like every month you have a new habit that you're forming. So like the first one is hydration, which sounds so obvious, but it really was like, you know, everybody needs to feel hydrated and you feel so much better when you are, but then it gets into like more, you know, different things like, like play, for example, like play is something that, you know, when you're a kid, you just do naturally. And you don't really think about as an adult, you might think like going to the gym is like your play, but in reality, like it really, really helps your mental health, like just to get out and like do creative fun things. So I was like doing like, you know, playing games or, you know, painting and stuff like that. It's like just being creative and like stuff that I'm not necessarily a great painter or something like that but but it was like a really good exercise just to get out and be creative um so yeah I loved made for I would definitely recommend that um I got into transcendental meditation which uh was like recommended to me by some friends and there's a center um here in LA in Santa Monica and so I went there and kind of like got trained in that and that was super interesting and you know, mind expanding, I guess. What's the center called? I think it's just, it's just called like transcendental meditation. It's like center for the audience. What's the difference between regular meditation and transcendental meditation? Sure. So it's more of like a structured meditation, I guess I would say like you go and you learn like from a teacher and they like, you have an app and you have like all kinds of stuff that you can like reference and there's like a community like when we were doing it we like had probably four or five other people there like learning with you and I thought that that was like really cool to have other people doing it with me because sometimes in meditation I feel like it's just kind of like okay go sit and go (laughs) you know (laughs) and don't talk to anyone and be quiet and shut your eyes and there's not really like a lot of structure so it was very helpful for me but the whole idea with transcendental meditation is like, it's kind of like the ocean metaphor where on the top there's a lot of waves and craziness and that's like where we live as people usually. But with meditation, you want to like get below the surface and really just be calm. 
So it's been really, really helpful for me. So how has picking up these these positive habits changed how you run, listen? So we, we've we really, like, pared down the company um, in a good way. Uh, it's been actually a really amazing year for us, much better than last year. Exactly. <laughs> um, and I, I feel so much, like, more positive about it now, and that's been really helpful just, like – even with, you know, my relationship with like my business partner or, you know, employees or vendors or anything like, I think that they can all see the difference in, in me. And that really helps the business. Yeah, that's, that's great. So what, when you guys were at the brink or maybe it was in the brink, but when you lost half the revenue, how did, did you have to go seek additional funding at that point? Did you just have did you tap into your own reserves? Like, how did you get out of that? Sure. So I have to say that the government programs were really helpful at that time. Um, the COVID relief, you know, PPP and whatnot. So that was like a huge help. And um, I feel really, you know, lucky, lucky that that was there. Obviously, if COVID didn't happen, we wouldn't have had to take that. But, <laughs> but at the same time, we're... Yeah, you know, at least there was something for us to fall back on at the time. And luckily since then we've rebounded, but that's that's what it was at the time. That is good to hear that like that funding and those programs went to such a good cause and really helped you keep your company afloat and now it's doing great things and, and still giving back, um, which was the original mission. So um so since then I'm sure you've you've uh donate even even more assisted hearing devices and and helped a lot more people what wh- were you at now with with that in terms of the total number of people that you've helped uh so we're at like 50k plus and unfortunately we haven't been able to travel lately to to actually do that but we have some programs going on in different countries various countries and like in africa right now that are kind of like self-sustaining so I really like, I, I'm itching to get back out there and I just want to go travel and help people and see the world. That's the most fun part of the job. So it's, it's been tough to not have that part of it. But uh, luckily, I think things are trending towards the positive. So. Yeah, definitely. Where's the first place you're going to visit? Oof. I don't know. I mean, I've never been to India, so I really mm. want to go there. We've done uh, Sri Lanka and some, you know, places close by, but I've never actually been to it India. It seems fitting for your life story to go there next. You know? <laughs> it's like eat, pray, love. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just, yeah, the, there's just probably just a whole nother side of the things that you're doing that, that you can learn over there, um, which is exciting. I mean, I'm down to go live with the monks or whatever yeah. I have to do. <laughs> so you recently also started a new project called Experiential Billionaire. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. So, yeah, everything after everything happened in 2020, um, I definitely dove deep into trying to figure out what would make like the most fulfilling life. And the answer for me personally was new experiences, like we talked about. Um, so I ended up like just really diving deep on the research and like interviewing a bunch of people that were experts on like life, you know, happiness and fulfillment and kind of came up with like a talk. And um, right now we're writing a book about it. I'm actually doing it with my partner from Listen. So uh, we're writing a book basically about the science behind fulfillment versus things. Like everybody knows that, you know, going on a vacation is better than like buying a watch. Right. But why don't humans really practice that? And like, why is the biggest regret of the dying that they didn't do things? Like there's definitely a problem there. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to like solve that. So we've been going around to like universities and whatnot and talking about this idea. Um, But eventually we'll have the book and uh, we're super excited to like, just kind of get it out there. That's great. How long have you been writing the book? Uh, just the last like six months or so. Okay. so not super and what's been time. the feedback at the universities? Uh, they love it. Honestly, I, 
I don't, I don't know if I went into it thinking about like really young people, but um, the feedback has been so good. And like a lot of these kids, you know, they're like 18 to 21, 22 years old. And they're like, not really thinking about like end of life regrets. And so, right. and so it's really interesting to talk to them. I've been loving it. What's the, uh, looking at the website, what is the section of expanding your time? Sure. So there's something really interesting about time perception. Like everybody's had that experience of like, you know, it's New Year's Eve and then all of a sudden like, you wake up and you're like, how did it already get to like Christmas again? Mm -hmm. Like every year just seems to go faster and faster. Like as you get older. Um, And one of the ways that you can like slow down the perception of time is like to have new experiences. Like say you're like every single day you eat the same thing and then you watch Netflix. It's like your time is going to fly by and you're never going to have like, you're going to be like, where did my life go? But if you're filling every single day with like new experiences and learning new things, you're going to be like, wow, like I, I feel like this year was like 10 years. Mm. So it's, it's a really interesting subject and I definitely am like trying to get super deep on time perception right now. And where are you learning uh, and educating yourself on some of those, those notions? Cause I think that's so true and right on that, that new experiences and having goals and just creating new challenges for yourself too. It makes everything a little bit more meaningful. Not only will it slow down time, but it gives you something to wake up for. It gives you a why versus like, Mm -hmm. if you're just going to go watch Netflix and eat the same thing every day, you're kind of just, you know, you're living, but not really, (laughs) you know, you're you're, you're existing. You're existing. There you go. There you go. So, so yeah, where have you learned like some of the, some of the stuff from, is there resources that other people can check out or. Yeah. Sure. So I think that we're just so lucky to live in this time right now where anybody can have access to information. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were living like a hundred years ago, like there's no way that I could do this. Um, So, I mean, obviously books, like I have probably 10 books on time perception, Um, lots of good stuff there, but there's so much on like YouTube and on, you know, something like a master class or Udemy or something that you can just literally go online and like search and find it. And that's, it's like the beauty of living in 2021 is that I can like have the same amount of access to information as like someone who's super wealthy or, you know, someone living in like the middle of nowhere. And I think that's really cool. Yeah. That's amazing. So I I see some of these accolades too, from some pretty notable people. So Richard Branson, Bill Clinton, like how did you uh, connect those dots? Like what happened there? Oh man. Honestly, it's doing philanthropy and really being intentional about authentically giving back and doing work has connected us with some really, really incredible people. And obviously they do not need to hang out with us. Um, (laughs) I'm pretty sure (laughs) Brands and Clintons are very busy and they don't need to, but they, you know, they, chose to like be around us for you know short periods of time obviously but because we are doing something authentic and they wanted to be involved and they're all actually super involved with Starkey Hearing Foundation which is the um, foundation that we work with so we've been really lucky to be around some pretty incredible people and get some good feedback you've had such a such an interesting um fulfilled life it seems, you know, coming from Flint, I just think about that, you know, I'm in the Chicago area and, and you, your family is from the automotive industry. Um, Mm -hmm. and obviously that's, that's my background as well. Like working at the factory and, and then seeing yourself now you're living in California, running this amazing business and being able to give back and now learning these life skills uh, and then passing those on through experiential, uh, billionaire. It's just, uh, it's just incredible. Thank you. I mean, is that where gratitude comes in and you're journaling and you like, do you have a practice of writing down the things you're thankful for? And is that included in it just to look at, look at like where you've, where you've came from and where you're at now in that journey? Oh my God. Gratitude is everything. And I don't know if you've been following like the science behind it. Um, there was just like a great Andrew uh, Huberman podcast about the science of gratitude. Definitely recommend checking that out. But um 
Yeah, it's been actually even more important than ever. Uh, I just got done with something that really, really changed my life forever uh, called the Hoffman Institute uh, up in Northern California. But uh, basically, it's like this seven day retreat that you go and you really like tap into a path to like rewiring your pathways in your brain. So you, so when you grow up, you have all of these like patterns that are imprinted on you from your parents and from their parents and so on that you don't even realize that are there most of the time. So what Hoffman does is like try to take those patterns and like make them into something positive or at least be aware of the patterns and transform it into something good <laughs> instead of a negative pattern. So one of the things that they really, really preach is, is gratitude. And I've been like joining their gratitude practices like every day on Instagram. And then I also have like my own practice where I just go outside on the beach here and like, you know, kind of just hand on heart. These are the things I'm grateful for today. Mm -hmm. And it really does help. You know, I think maybe even like 10, 20 years ago, people might have thought gratitude was like a little woo-woo or something, but <laughs> but it really does help. Yeah. I mean, 10 or 20 years ago, mo the majority of people would have would have thought meditation was like yoga babble. I would say probably it's more like 20 years ago, but now it's, I mean, there's still some people that might think that, but it's definitely gaining in popularity and the, the science is uh, undeniable at this point on how much it helps. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that's something that should be taught in every school, something that should be at like every corporation. It definitely shouldn't be something that's like in this other world of like, Oh, that's weird. Or that's like, mm -hmm. you know, hippie. It's, it's legitimate. And it's, uh, it definitely needs to be more in the, more in the spotlight. Yeah. I mean, my, even my son Grayson at night, he is, he has a, this, incredible wired brain and typically at at night he's either you know, we let him watch tv a little bit because after school he's in therapy and he's doing a lot of things so he he needs a couple hours to himself just to do what he wants but then his brain is so charged up that that the, a way to like turn it off instantly where he just can get out of that mindset is through meditation so we'll do a headspace app together at nights so we'll do a headspace meditation in his bed and I'm telling you, within two minutes, uh, nine times out of ten, he's out. <laughs> he's just, it's the first time he just was, like, relaxed and just taking yeah. a deep breath and just taking, like, two, three deep breaths at night. He's just gone. Like, it's it's incredible. And um, funny. I do the same thing. I do mine, like, right before I go to bed. It really helps me go to sleep. I'm super intrigued with the Hoffman Institute. What else, what are some other nuggets that you've learned, you learned there? I know there's probably a ton because it was seven days. Was there anything that surprised you outside of gratitude? Honestly, it was the most transformational. It was the best thing I've ever done for myself as far as like investing in my personal growth. Um, the pattern thing is like the main thing for me. Like, so being aware of patterns and changing them was like the most important thing for me. So for if there's like an example, it's like, you know, my mom like didn't really express emotion very well so I grew up being that way and so I need to change that right mm. or my dad was adopted so he has abandonment issues and so I have abandonment mm. issues <laughs> there's like all these things that seem so obvious that you may have never like thought of before but that really like show up in your relationships whether it's like with a partner or kids or you know your business partner or anything like that. And it really just like brought to you know the front of my mind of like, of all of these kind of terrible things that I've done and acted out in the past and, and why I did those things. And so now if I'm like thinking about doing something, I'll take the right road instead of, you know, the, the bad yeah. <laughs> taking like what I would normally do and going towards the way of like a more, enlightened path i guess i would say yeah no that makes that makes a ton of sense well it was great to connect with you today i hope to have you on another time we can we could dive deeper into some of this stuff because i think we could just keep peeling back the onion and your uh your life's been amazing so far and and just hearing you you're 
seem like such a positive inspiration and I could tell by the way you're smiling and the way you're carrying yourself. It just, you know, you're happy. And that's, that is uh, definitely something that is contagious. So keep that up. And how, how do people find out more about you, Bridget? Pretty much every social media. Actually, I really only have Instagram, um, just at Bridget L. Hilton. And then uh, listensound.com is my company. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. And and, uh, we will uh, hopefully be in touch again very soon. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Yeah, you too.